Excellent. Thank you very much for coming uh, this, uh, this afternoon. So the, uh, the panel today, we're going to talk about um, regulating non-bank financial institutions. Well, what are non-bank financial institutions? Surely one of the worst uh, acronyms <laughs> anybody could come up with just designed to like put uh, your relatives and friends to sleep. But in fact, you know, um, I'm going to explain their significance just with a couple of statistics. And these are from Gary Gensler, who's the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. He said, as of now, in the United States, private markets are now a $25 trillion asset class. That's more than U.S. commercial bank assets. In 2022, private markets raised $3.7 trillion compared to $1 trillion in public markets. Now, what do these private markets represent? The reason I bring up this statistic is that they, for the most part, represent the activity of what we call these non-bank financial institutions. Um, now, some of these have been around a long time. Bond markets are as old, you know, they're centuries old. We've had pension funds, mutual funds, life insurance companies, long time. But, you know, in the last few decades, they've been joined th through financial innovation by things like exchange-traded funds, leveraged loans, syndicated loans, private equity, venture capital, and now, of course, perhaps the biggest and fastest growing private credit. And these represent tremendous opportunities and benefits, uh, you know, through the forces of financial innovation. But they also have risks. And you only have to go back 16 years ago when we had the global financial crisis, which was a crisis rooted in the excesses and the failures of what we at the time called shadow banks, which is really just a euphemism for non-bank financial institutions. So essentially, what we want to do is talk about the two sides of that equation, an asset class which has a lot of benefit and potential, but, produces, but poses important risks at the micro and the macro level. And to talk about this question, we have a really uh, amazing panel. Uh, on my left is His Excellency uh, Mohammed Al Jadan, the uh, finance minister of Saudi Arabia. And I think we were just discussing now the longest serving finance minister of the G20. You know, <laughs> take that out. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, to your left. <laughs> Ann Walsh, chief investment officer and managing partner at Guggenheim Investments. Uh, Evan Sedell of the uh, Alberta Investment Management Company, fellow Canadian like me. And, you know, knowing Canada, I guess we can call the Alberta Fund is basically a sovereign wealth fund, right, Evan? Yeah, that's yeah. right, actually. Yeah. We do run part of a sovereign wealth fund, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And on the far left, Steve Tannenbaum, who's the founder of Golden Tree Asset Management, one of the biggest players in this space. So people are very well equipped to talk about this. Um, Steve, I'm going to talk with you, and I'm going to like actually start with the, sort of the premise that I put out there. Fifteen years ago, I was, like as a reporter, writing about the collapse of non-bank financial institutions, left, right, and center, the bailouts that were necessary, never again, financial crisis. Here we are 16 years later. By the broadest definition, these markets are even bigger. Should we be worried? So um, looking, are we in better shape than 15 years ago? Yeah. Absolutely. If you look at the leverage in the system 15 years ago, it was just a multiple. And you can measure it through um, um, really uh, the leverage of <coughs> banks. And uh, you could see how the return on equity in the banks was so um, elevated because of the leverage. Um, in terms of the um, environment or the market getting bigger, well, that's a function of the world growth of the economy. Mm -hmm. There's a demand for this credit. So if the economy wasn't growing, actually, if it were the same size, that would be pretty scary because the economy would suggest that the world economies uh, are not growing. So I feel like we're in much better shape. That's not to say you take something like, like the pandemic and you see something like mortgage REITs which had margin leverage, which seemed like a smart idea at the time until it wasn't, and they, um, and they basically all, all had margin calls. So there was a run on that sector of, of finance during the pandemic, but broadly speaking, the system is much better. Um, I think, um, and you continue as some of the um, episodes of last year with Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse, there's certainly a refinement, but broadly speaking, much better. If I, may I pick up on that? Because yes. if you looked at the share of non-bank financial institutions, according to the FSB, in financial assets, it was 47% in 2007. Today, it's 47%. So apropos of your comment, yeah. the world just got bigger. Now, it's a big problem because it's a lot of numbers. But the world is safer in the sense because their banks now hold more capital, so they have less leverage. They're more regulated from a liquidity point of view. The, the, the fact that we have, and by we, I include a pension fund as one of the shadow banks, have occupied some of that territory. We do not engage in maturity transformation. We do track our liquidity, and we have far less leverage than a bank, which would be 24 to 25 to 1. Inherently, the world is a safer place. 
That's an intended consequence. I think of the capital imposed on capital regulations imposed on banks. That that activity went into the so-called shadow banking sector. To to just uh, add to what Eric, Eric said, it's a broad topic. Is probably in 2007 there was a, a heads I win and tells you lose kind of um, setup, and I think that that's been largely more even-handed, even from a um, what the banks can do and can't do from a compensation structure where you're not paid all at once. So there's a lot of, um, I think, improvements to the system. Are the instruments fundamentally different today than they were 15 or 16 years ago? Um, there's always evolving. So, so, so the short answer is, is there um, opportunistic ways that people want to have credit? Um, is there a more efficient way to get credit for more plain vanilla? Um, yes, so there are improvements evolving and credits evolved. Um, would I say it's materially different in terms of what the purpose is? Not really. In terms of how it's executed, absolutely. Mm. I would say I hope so. The short, <laughs> the short answer to your question is I really hope so. I mean, with, with the evolution of the fintech um, yeah. over the last 10, 15 years, I, I think we should be expecting significantly different products and different choices, different risk, different investors base, and different borrowers base or beneficiaries base uh, as a result of that. But obviously, it is all also about credit. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's just being able to provide credit faster, cheaper, and with more choice. If I could add on to the comments of uh, His Excellency, with regard to, there's a couple of other things too, and that is, the, um, uh, the synthetically created uh, securities, CDO squared uh, uh, and the like, they failed in the late 1990s. And there were short memories because then they became reinvigorated and became a big part of the leading edge of the problem when uh, the financial crisis occurred. And if we if we're you know, kind of thinking about the one word that is probably the most important for regulators and uh, investors to be thinking about, and that is the extreme levels of leverage that can be created, and ex an extremely um, uh, risky area would be synthetically. Mm -hmm. And so, as long as we don't see that and the rise of that, and and I hope our memories aren't terribly short with regard to uh, with regard to the impact of those types of transactions. Uh, memories are very short. I mean, how long was it between the 1990s and 2000? And that's, that's right. That's what that kind of has me worried a little bit. But, um, well, put, but it, put it this way: 2008 is further from us now than the 1990s were from 2008. So true. just. But and I actually want to stay with you for a second because, His Excellency did mention that you know, th with fintech, there's been a variety of, of, of growth of types of instruments. But the question I want to ask you: So Jamie Dimon unfortunately could not be here. <laughs> so I'm going to pretend to be Jamie Dimon. And if I'm Jamie Dimon, I'm going to say the only reason this private market grows is because we as banks, we have capital requirements, which are bigger than ever, deep and more stricter than ever. We have liquidity requirements, which are more onerous than ever. My risk controls are being checked all the time. You know, I am like held to disclosure requirements and so forth. And plus, I get called before Congress every six months and get, you know, the stuff and beaten out of me, right? Yeah. That's why your market has grown, because it's an arbitrage play. You don't bear any of those costs. What's the answer to that? Well, with all due respect to Jamie Dimon, um, I think it's a l little bit more fundamental than that. And that is the capital markets, particularly as I think about the US, have changed dramatically over the last number of years. Um, we've gone from a world where there were many, many publicly listed uh, companies in the US. We're down to about 3,600 listed stocks in the US. And contrast that with private equity-owned companies. That has exploded to about 5,500. Crossover point was reached about seven, eight years ago now. And so as a result, private equity companies are not going to be coming to the public markets. And they're less so inclined to come to um, the, the uh, syndicated, broadly syndicated loan market through banks as well. That leaves this opportunity set for private investors to become the lender of choice, also to work closely with private equity sponsors in order to provide the necessary capital. So I think it's, it's part of a larger narrative with regard to the development and evolution of the capital markets. Can I just comment on this? I, I think, first of all, there is a definition problem. We just need to make sure that we really understand exactly what we are talking about. Uh, when we talk about non-bank financial institutions, I mean, these are possibly investment banks who are actually heavily regulated. Uh, pension funds, which 
and a lot of jurisdictions are very heavily regulated. Um, but it could be um, other credit providers who are lightly, in a lot of jurisdictions, lightly uh, regulated. I think for, for me, what, what we are talking about is institutions that create credit yeah. and provide credit. Okay, so that's, hopefully we agree on we this, agree. if you disagree. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two, there is fundamental difference in these institutions. Who takes depositors' money and who doesn't? Mm -hmm. And the difference here is not actually on the operational side. Or it is actually on stakeholders and the table of making decisions. So if you are a bank taking deposits, actually the, owner, the owners of your bank are not on the table in the boardroom when you make decisions and take risks. They are the depositors who are not represented. And this is why central banks actually play that role. They play actually the role of the owner, the, the depositors, to protect the depositors. So that's why we get used over decades and possibly even hundreds of years of central banks focusing on deposit takers, regulating them heavily to make sure that the money of the depositors are not put in undue risk. That is, to me, is totally different from mature investors who choose to provide credit and assess their own risks, and they are on the table, or their representatives, yes. and they, they should be allowed to take that risk. So Evan, I know you want to uh, yeah. come so, in here, but actually, my next question is going to go to you anyway, right? Okay. So I'll now double, I'm going to make I'll you, I'm going to force you to answer the question I'm going to ask, as opposed to what you want to be asked, okay? And so I want to actually pick up on that point, Your Excellency, exactly that point, because again, like the historical argument for there being a perimeter between the bank and the non-bank sector is exactly <laughs> what you said. The banks, uh, their liability holders are depositors who are insured by the federal government, right? D you know, so different, so, uh, different form of moral hazard, right? Different in people involved, you know? So, but all those arguments were true in 2008, and yet we had a crisis that required the intervention by the authorities, a significant like backstopping by the sovereign in many countries of like many non-banks. And I, I talk about Lehman Brothers, I talk about AIG, I talk about Fannie and Freddie, I talk about like all the uh, structured investment vehicles, money market funds, okay, you know, uh, reserve fund broke the buck, right? Required a complete federal backstop of the entire money market complex, which was supposed to be not like any of these things. So the point I'm trying to make here is that I understand the point you're making, but where is the assurance that um, these things will not become systemic? And just to make my point a little bit better, we don't have a regulator on the panel, so I'm kind of being the regulator here, right? Okay. So this is what the IMF wrote eight months ago. The combination of poor market liquidity, high leverage, high degree of interconnectedness between the non-banks and the banks is, is most dangerous to the financial system because it can amplify asset price changes and then sp spread stress. So that is my question to you, Evan, is that given that we have seen, in, seen episodes where in spite of the perimeter that you've identified, non-bank stress has required the intervention of the authorities. What do we do? It's true, and we've had that experience in Canada where the Caisse de one of the pension funds actually, <clears throat> had some ABCP structures that collapsed. The Bank of Canada had to jump in and support them. Secondly, another pension fund had significant liquidity squeeze as a result of derivatives and hedges. The Bank of Canada had to support them. So what we've done as an industry is we're, we're now self-regulating, and this is not going to be an appealing answer to this crowd but self-regulating our own liquidity. We do a stress liquidity coverage ratio, as banks do, because the end of liquidity for a pension fund is disastrous. We don't have a leverage problem, but we may indeed, so we don't have a solvency problem, but we may indeed have a liquidity problem, and we, we report to the Bank of Canada on a formal basis that way. That's just, but the problem with shadow banks is it's not a monolithic solution. As His Excellency said, there's a different social contract with banks, and you said this, Greg, different social contract with banks that have deposit insurance mm -hmm. and, and uh, access to the central bank than people like us who don't unless we're given it. And as a result, it's a little rich of Jamie, this is my point, to talk about regulatory arbitrage when that's exactly what he was engaging in. He was engaging in a too-big-to-fail arbitrage that he'd get backstopped, and the moral hazard supporting that is what we've tried to move out of the system. If market discipline is regulating the markets, that's a good place to start, not a bad place to start. I'd, I'd also add, just with the IMF, um, of course the banks are, are going to be working with whoever to facilitate transactions. So that's 
kind of an evergreen, or you're going to have many institutions, many financial players who are working to um, bring about the maximum price. And if they weren't able to work together, it would work. In, it would result in lower prices. So the fact that banks and uh, private credit lenders are working together to me is is pretty typical. And in fact, that they're trying to um, um, amplify their division of labor labor is you know makes makes a lot of sense so the the issue that I see is just more is it responsible and um, it's certainly further in growth I think think one of the issues is to balance you know as you talked about on, on your first question to me is it's natural for credit to be growing because it means the economy is growing and so it's natural for banks to work yeah. with um, shadow banks or you know um, financial um unregulated financial institutions. Okay. Well, um, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, as you probably know, um, last year, looking at the private market question, decided that there was a lack of adequate uh, regulation in this field. And so they put a proposal pr for a proposal, a set of comments that would affect many of the individuals mm -hmm. on this panel. They basically want a lot of these private asset managers to basically uh, ha pursue greater disclosure with respect to fees, with respect to performance, uh, perhaps like assume greater liability in the uh, field of negligence and so on. These have not been well received by the industry. <coughs> like uh, Steve or Anne, do you want to like comment on whether, whether you think the SEC has got it right or wrong? So um, I, I think the SEC uh, has been able to touch the private credit market and industry um, through marketing and the usual rules on, on uh, as you mentioned, fees. Uh, and disclosure of, of returns. Um, where the industry is concerned, and, and maybe this is um, uh, not necessarily in support of the industry, is particularly in the case of valuation and pricing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so there's not been a lot of volatility in the price of private credit in particular, or private transactions, relatively speaking, because there's not the same level of price discovery as there is in public markets. Uh, and so, uh, and I think this is one angle that the SEC would like to spend a lot more time on. Um, more broadly, away from the SEC, regulators are concerned, and including Federal Reserve officials, um, are concerned about the lack of transparency more broadly into the investment practices and lending practices of the uh, of the uh, private credit industry. Um, and until and unless uh, somehow uh, a a uh, an ETF or other mutual fund gets formed where uh, where these private credit transactions are offered to the retail investor. I, I think there will continue to be um, uh, uh, you know a, a separation between the regulators and private credit. We've seen in bank loan space uh, where the syndicated loan market uh, has entered into the retail product space with these offerings. And, and they have a number of issues. One, you can't transfer, in the case of an ETF, you can't transfer a bank loan into an individual's portfolio. So if for some reason there was something to ever happen to that particular transaction or that structure, um, the, the uh, outcome would be probably pretty troubled. Um, we haven't been tested in that situation. Um, and so private credit, as long as it doesn't end up somehow trying to attract the individual investor um, uh, as, a, as a participant, I think can continue to argue that they do not need to be regulated in the same way. So I'm going to share another statistic with you. In 1983, 2% of households fit the definition of accredited investor, you know, wealthy enough uh, that they didn't have to be treated like a retail investor. That figure today is 18.5% because the threshold has never been adjusted for inflation or income growth. So we have a large segment of the U.S. population I can't speak for Canada or other countries, which could potentially be attracted to this asset class right now. So I think that raises the question, is the SEC directionally right, Steve? Should, should there be more, at least to protect that growing segment of the population that could be involved? In so um, a, a couple things. First is, just, just to get back to regulation, on marking third-party marks and a common established pricing methodology is really important, you know, for uh, confidence and also as economic environments change and industry prospects change, I think it's important to have confidence that there was a consistent methodology. So I think that's something that should um, continue to be developed, and I think it it also makes uh, results much more uniform and comparable. 
In terms of, it'll be interesting what the alpha that's added with some of the alternative um, um, programs on retail. So just having a name brand without the, al without the alpha, I think has a lot more um, issues than whether they should be able to buy it or not. Mm -hmm. you know, so, I think, um, um, so I think that's another issue. Um, and from a financial advisor, just saying that you can get X, Y, and Z, um, a piece of X, Y, and Z without looking at what the value that's added with all the extra fees or what's been added given the size that some of these institutions have grown to. So I think that's going to be, you know, whether they're good investments to me, I, that's how I start thinking about it. Yeah. And it, at least um, it seems like many of them haven't been. Greg, I'd say part of our job as pension fund managers because we wouldn't be included in your stat on accredited investors, but we basically are an aggregation of non-accredited investors that through us become accredited and participate in those markets. And that's, that's, a, that's an adjustment that that works, right? That purchasing power comes together in a way that, that can participate in a market in an informed way. But also there's another added element to that, and that is, is in the case of a retail, or, uh, a retail product, the regulator has certain disclosure requirements because the retail investor can't themselves do the level of due diligence right. that, we on, can that you can. The, yeah. and, and, and in today's market, the aggregator, if you want to refer to yourself as that, um, uh, then is performing the due diligence. Uh, and I can tell you, sitting on the, the asset manager side, the due diligence You don't go is, light. It, well, you don't go light, that's right. <laughs> and, uh, and so, in fact, um, I would say it's more rigorous even uh, than, than uh, what the SEC might actually have you know, uh, mandated in terms of disclosure. So you take the place of that regulator in that way. And as long as that continues to function strongly, then, um, then again, I think that, that that can give some comfort Did to you investors. Did you a regulator? No, I said <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> in the place of. <laughs> You were once a regulator. Yeah, that's in fact, <laughs> can I just ma make a comment? I think I think there are multiple points that um, you mentioned and the colleagues that really warrants just reflection. Number one, I think when you talked about government intervention and you know the fact that you know they jumped into other institutions to to save them, I think governments does not take light um, bailing out institutions. Yeah. Uh, so they know this is taxpayers' money, public money, and they need to assess really what is the public good that is behind it. They bailed out car manufacturers in the US before. They have nothing to do with the financial system for some good cause, strategic yeah. cause. Um, but in this context, I think a lot of it, actually, the reason is you will find that the box stops at a bank that has not been regulated properly enough yeah. And they do want that bank to be exposed to these institutions. Failures. Yeah. So they need to save this, these institutions to save the banks. The second point is, I think there is a big difference between regulating and awareness. And the government has a role to play in raising the awareness of investors, particularly retail investors, or investors who are considered sophisticated, but they are not sophisticated enough. Because a lot of times, if you don't raise that awareness, even if they are technically qualify as qualified investors, they can be manipulated. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the players or the ecosystem is smart enough to put that small print that will just satisfy the light regulations. but. You need investors who are savvy. You need to raise awareness. And you need even to encourage them to use sophisticated asset managers who are able to do that due diligence on their behalf. The last point I want to say is we need to be very careful not to apply regulatory framework that applies to banks to non-bank financial institutions. Very careful, because that could potentially kill innovation that could potentially actually deprive investments, deprive private sectors and others from credit that can be provided by institutions that are willing to take higher risk than banks would have taken. Have you actually seen that tension in the Saudi context? Absolutely. I mean, in, in, in Saudi, I can give an example. Now it is done and behind us, the Capital Market Authority uh, started allowing one um, fund to basically lend 
to small and medium enterprises. And the central bank was not comfortable with that. And they wanted actually to apply the regulatory framework that applies um, to um, financing companies that are supervised by the central bank. And there was a tension. Ultimately, the two regulators had to sit down together and say, what is it that we are worried about? Mm -hmm. Why are you not allowing funds to actually lend investors money who are willing when they subscribed on the units of this fund to lend? Is it systemic risk? We can understand, then just restrict their ability to access banks' money mm -hmm. to a certain limit. So that there is no exposure. But for you then to just say, because they may cause systemic risk, we need to be harsh on their regulatory framework mm -hmm. so that you know, they will not pose any risk, I think you are potentially depriving your economy from growth. Significantly, and are there instances where what is um, purportedly concerned about systemic risk or prudential risk actually just rent-seeking? It's in, in some sense the banks and their representatives trying to protect their status. Absolutely, <laughs> uh, I, I think competition plays, but there are other reasons the industry players we, would we've stepped you. into the regional banking space in the U.S. in a significant way in the last year, and so we're taking up the demand that or supply, I guess that. Uh, the day, to clarify, you're buying regional banks or you're competing no, for credit? No, we're competing for credit. So engaging in what private debt, either through funds or directly through on our own. We estimate that a trillion dollars of M&A activity happened because people like us stepped into the market when regional <coughs> banks went away. So that's kept the economy going in a way. Yeah. Th that's a good outcome. Historically, if you look at the 90s, where the um, regional banks would do LBO lending, it was a tough space for them. And it was a space where um, there were a lot of uh, charge-offs, usually during recessions, which didn't justify the lending during the good times. And what, what we saw was they, were good, they felt very confident at charging six or 700 basis points over LIBOR, now SOFR, but we're not so confident with 1,000. So pricing um, was also um, tough um, historically, I found for regional banks, particularly at the wider um, level, you know, for us, a, um, a basic uh, thesis would be, what's the risk-adjusted spread? Um, so basically, um, what's your gross yield minus expected default, um, um, accounting for the volatility of outcome? Yeah. And that's not necessarily what it seemed like they were um, broadly speaking at in the 90s and early 2000s, how they operated, and as a result, People who are more confident taking that approach took a lot of market share. Are you saying that basically for their own institutional reasons, there were certain credits that they simply would not lend to because their default probabilities were too high, even in a scenario where their risk-adjusted return was appropriate? Actually, I would just add something to that, and they weren't terribly confident about which ones those, those were. Okay. And that's what, and that's, um, that created the opportunity. So you're saying basically the private credit market fills a gap that literally would not exist, at least in the U.S. context, absent. You know, Absolutely. Well, and I think to add on to that, especially in the pe periods of time that you're speaking of as well, those are periods of time when capital gets rationed. And banks are more likely to ration capital, um, uh, relatively speaking, because they have little of it to, to allocate, and, and they are very much... Uh, pro-cyclical yeah. in terms of their uh, in terms of their risk management, and so as a result, private credit does step in in those particular situations. Mm -hmm. We're certainly seeing it today. And I think that's the point you mer you're making, Evan, about Indeed. the last year, where you yeah. stepped into a space in a context where these mid-sized regionals were pulling back. That's yeah. right. Yeah, but let's <clears throat> just to go back to the regulatory question for a moment. Okay, so. Uh, your Excellency, you talked about the importance of information, right? So, can I get the panel to at least agree, perhaps, that notwithstanding where you want to go with regulation, there's something to be said for having more information out sure. there. So I think at least, you know, as a journalist and having talked to a lot of regulators, one of the things that bothers them is there's just so much that they don't know. I mean, we know a lot about banks, right? We collect information on a quarterly basis. We literally don't know the size or nature of a lot of these markets. Can, can I, what do the panelists feel about, like, at least a reporting regimen so that we actually have a sense of the size and nature of this uh, market? So, so one of the... Um benefits of private credit is actually being discreet. So that's, it's not the main uh, benefit. So in other words, not um, disclosing 
who's taking money if they're trying to um, build up, um, you know, they don't want to be public with their um, information. So um, you certainly want to make sure it's marked correctly and that it's fairly valued, but a lot of the lenders don't want the information about what they're doing. If they're taking loans, um, who they're buying, and they're private, that's, and that's the point. So I think one of the issues of more transparency is not always right because a lot of the borrowers deliberately, um, for good business reasons, don't want to um, disclose what their borrowing is. On a per transaction basis. Uh, yeah. But I'll tell you, from our point of view, we do disclose the aggregate level of our investments by asset class, by number and volume. We do not, and it's not by agreement, we don't disclose discrete yeah. investments, yeah. which and I think is what you're talking about. Exactly. Banks don't disclose anyway. Pardon? I mean, banks do, don't disclose specific. Right. right. I mean, I, mean I guess I'm not thinking about like name by name disclosure, but like Aggregate. anonymized information that can be aggregated up so that at least on a system wide basis, we have a sense of, you know, the, 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 the nature of this market and its size. I, I think, if I may, uh, I think regulating this industry smartly is necessary to avoid systemic risks okay. yeah. and to maintain financial stability. Yeah. But that is the limit. I think beyond that, yeah. and they, I mean, they are required to, to uh, you know, uh, comply with US GAAP or IFRS yeah. accounting principles. And uh, if they are public companies, they will need to publish. If they are not public, they will need to send reports to their investors. But I think we need just to make sure that we smartly regulate them, but we don't um, you know, go beyond that to intrude into their business because that could potentially jeopardize productivity, innovation, and potentially uh, deprive credit going to industries and individuals and businesses that need it that they cannot get it from banks. So even if we don't believe that um, there's a radically new regulatory regime that's necessary, do we think that there might still be nonetheless risks out there in the market right now? You, you observe this market on a daily, weekly basis. What do you think? Are, what are the hazards that might be out there with respect to pricing, with respect to leverage, with respect to quality, and so on? Are, are there going to be sort of blow-ups somewhere down the line that we need to watch for? Who's going to say no to that? I mean, the, 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 exactly. the problems in the system are largely in connect, our interconnectedness to institutions that are subject to runs, banks, some other non-bank financial institutions are subject to runs, open-ended funds, for example, without gates. Um, broker dealers can be too if they're financing the repo market because the repo market is a runnable market. Attending to the level of interconnectedness of my activity, for example, and the banking system is an important thing for regulators to pay attention to because there are, we've got to remember 20th, finance, 20th century financial was the trigger of the US financial crisis. Not a big institution, a quite small institution. And, and then there were a series of, what's the term? Infection. Uh, contagion. Contagion, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you, Greg, you're the journalist. Um, contagion in the system that resulted from that and made it much larger than it otherwise needed to be. But, yeah, but right now, like, we have, like, we've come off a period of tremendous growth in private credit, right? I mean, in credit. It's a very large there. And, like, I have been in this business for longer than I care to admit in front of a public yeah. audience. And it has that kind of feel like it's kind of like when you've had so much growth and people have made so much money for so long, there's something, you know, something's going to blow up. You know the old saying, like, when the tide goes out, you see right. who's swimming naked, right? So we've just been through a period of very high interest rates. They're going to be with us for a while. Are, like, aren't there things out there that worry you? So um, a few things. First, the returns. The idea that triple C to um, single B credit will have risk-adjusted returns of three to 400 basis points going forward like they've had going backwards is a tough bet. Yeah. And so, so the returns are going to shrink. Um, in terms of um, um, it's really been a substitute um, for um, what the banks used to distribute. So there was an innovation where, um, whether it was to pay a dividend or do an acquisition quickly. So to the extent that banks or other providers can come in quicker or cheaper, it'll probably come in. So I, I feel the returns are probably not going to be as excessive as they've been looking backwards. Um, so, so that would be the one, the one issue in terms of how the asset class behaves. I do feel as if the idea that if um, private equity is the um, 
primary issuer of private credit, the most sophisticated issuers are going to provide creditors with excess returns doesn't really seem like a great business model to bet on in the future. So I don't expect that to uh, continue. I think well, there is one uh, uh, risk that, in addition to what was already been said, and that is I look at the market in two different ways. There's credit now and, and within the last, say, uh, uh, 12 months. And then there's legacy credit in the private space that was made and issued against triple C uh, rated borrowers uh, in 2021 when there, there was a great deal of refinancing that occurred at lower rates than today. Um, and at some point, uh, those particular companies may in fact prove even at their lower borrowing rate, especially if they borrowed on a flooding rate that's no longer a lower rate, mm. um, that they may, uh, they may be feeling stress if we are to see the slowdown in the economy that certainly our firm predicts. Um, and, uh, and, and that could be an area of risk. I think that would result in if there's a, if there's a series of defaults of size and magnitude, um, that will cause regulators to wonder if, in fact, the underwriting standards are as strong as the as private credit industry seems to claim, uh, and whether or not that will be a way for them to work their way into some sort of regulatory oversight. So I do have a concern about the legacy holdings. Oh, one other thing I'd add, just in private credit, I've seen the most innovation in credit in uh, the last, call it, decade in private credit. So in the 90s, it might have been structured products, here, so, so I don't want to, there's been a lot of interesting and uh, innovative positive aspects to private credit. So I don't want to leave that out in sure. terms of um, why it's been a, uh, a good uh, neighborhood to be. Okay. Um, I think we have some time for questions. Um, if, uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, can I get, get the microphone here too, sir? You, you state your name and affiliation if you could. Thank you. My name is Khaled Dabar. I'm the chairman of SABIC. Uh, very interesting discussion. Very good to see you some of uh, mm -hmm. previous friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, in the context of regulation that is being discussed, I was hoping, actually I was surprised, that I didn't hear any reference to the roles of custodians and trustees. Some of them are in Guernsey, Jersey, Cayman Islands, uh, maybe London or Frankfurt or, or New York. And their role in ensuring that the IPS, the investment policy statement of pension plans, of uh, endowments, some of these pension plans and endowments are managed by firms represented here, and, you know, including BlackRock and Wellington. So what is the role of these uh, two important players, trustees and custodian, who report on, on the investments to the trustees to ensure that the IPS is complied with? Thank you very much. Yeah, very good question. Does anybody want to tackle that one? So I think the reason that we're sort of sort of sitting here stumped a little bit is because um, it, they don't play much of a role now, no. um, and uh, and <clears throat> it's it's really quite administrative. Um, should they, if if assets are held in trust, absolutely, then they do read the investment policy statement and then they do actively engage to ensure adherence, but they don't perform any additional underwriting responsibilities. It is, it is administrative in my experience. So I'm not sure that I see much role for them changing. And in fact, I think they want less responsibility um, uh, rather than more. Uh, any other questions? So um, I, we've spent a lot of time talking about the regulation and risk of these things. I want to spend the last few minutes talking about the potential in the future and so on. So this. And as a class has grown and evolved and, and, and like uh, uh, morphed, what do you see in the next few years? What new sort of markets might this market address? And in particular, I'd like the panel's thoughts on the way private credit and related uh, private markets can assist in the needs of emerging markets, which have enormous capital requirements in the next few years. Things for poverty reduction, things for infrastructure, things for green transition. Anybody want to tackle that one? We're engaged through an organization, we at AIMCO, are engaged in an organization called the uh, Investor Leadership Network in mobilizing private capital, particularly for transition finance opportunities. So we have a transition finance pool. that we will, It's just slightly over a billion dollars. Our fund's about 120, so it's not that large, or, that will be oriented towards that. We're also talking to our Canadian government about effectively war bonds. Governments can put their own security and credit behind a risk that we wouldn't otherwise want to take, de-risk it, and then we will commit to that in a significant way. because we want sounds like Brady bonds. They would be rather like Brady bonds. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, basically providing the first loss portion, as it were. Right. Yeah. Sure. 
Um, Steve, you're... Blended finance, I'm sorry. Blended finance through them or through multilateral development banks would be very attractive in our models we're looking at. Sorry. No, no I, I just... Uh, um, in, in terms of, um, first, from a liability management, so liability management is you have a um, too much debt um, that private credit can come in and be a solution provider, whether it's through offering a tender, through a subsidiary, so that's one way. As it applies to emerging markets, um, can help be a provider in situations where um, haven't gone according to plan. Um, and um, you know, it's really innovative lending in which takes the form, you know, being called private credit, but it's really innovative lending where you can um, um, protect yourself from the downside yeah. and participate in some of the upside. But I, I view it as more innovative in terms of terms that um, provide a good um, protection with the upside. Uh, you know, structured products haven't really been um, that evident or, or um, practice that uh, much in, in um, countries like Brazil, but there's no good reason why. So I could see private credit or um, credit <coughs> solutions um, helping, you know, um, innovate in countries such as that, which have pretty good scale, and there's no reason why, and, and pretty good consumer behavior for why that wouldn't be the case. I'm going to go back to His Excellency's um, definition of private investment more broadly and say there's a lot of opportunity. Private credit, we've been mostly, I think, referencing corporate credit here, but, but the truth is it's a very wide category. Um, and to uh, Steve's term, innovation, it's very innovative these days. It includes um, uh, novel ways to access uh, real estate investments, um, infrastructure investments, which is particularly important, of course, to emerging markets. Um, uh, new ways to do asset lending. And in this way, again, private credit is moving away uh, uh, borrowers from traditional bank uh, institutions and banking institutions. These thoughtful uh, ways to deploy uh, credit technology, if you want to call it that, can be utilized much more globally and give investors investment protection in places where they mother otherwise might not have been feeling so secure to lend to. And so I think, I think these are actually helping to broaden out the scope and geography of private investment. Can I cover just one, one very quickly? I think possibly just outside the norm sure. yeah. here is the challenge that low-income country face in terms of their debt sustainability. And if you take actually quite a large number of these um, countries, they would be countries who actually have endowments and assets that they just need support to be able to monetize these assets over time and helping them restructure that debt. And, and under the common framework, obviously, we need to work with the private side creditors to restructure. But then they also need the help of institutions like our friends here to provide them with the support yeah. in conjunction with multilateral development institutions to actually be able to weather the three or five or six years period that they need to develop their own endowments, industries, and, and whatever. I, I think there is a lot of room, uh, a lot of opportunities that we can utilize private credit with multilateral institutions to help even in a more innovative way. But it'll take a lot of engagement and mutual engagement between the private sector, the public sector, and the multilateral Absolutely. sector, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Great conversation. Thank you, everybody. Thanks uh, you know, for your thoughts. Really enjoyed it. And thank you to the audience for listening. Hope that you uh, found it helpful. Thank you. Thank you.